Twenty for life to keep. Did you grow up in Canada? Were you alive in the nineties? Did you love YTV? F yeah, you did. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Right now, you're seeing the handsome face of DJ Mikhail, but now you're seeing him live in person. You know what? Right before we begin this, I got I got to tell you, DJ. First of all, I love your name and I love pronouncing it. You feel <laughs> fun. All right. Second of all. Um, today was my own personal, are you afraid of the dark, scary story? Because I'm really, I'm not a tech wizard, but I do like tech and I like it when it works. And when nothing worked, I almost feel like Gary and one of the other people just screwed me over by throwing some, uh, dried milk in a, uh, in a campfire and, and said, here's the tale of nothing works. Your microphone stand will break 10 minutes before you go on. You'll have no lighting. <laughs> Uh, the email won't work with the link, and it's uh, you know hilarious. Ten minutes before you go on. Well, well, well. Speak, no speaking of nothing, speaking, of nothing works. I'm getting a weird uh, feedback. Like there's a delay. The I guess so. Yeah. Right. Weird. Uh, do you have any headphones or anything like that? It might stop it from happening. Speaking of nothing works. I'm getting a weird feedback. <laughs> or it's playing on your on their browser. And YouTube is open. That's very possible. Uh, I only have. Well, let me try this. Yeah. See, this is another story about. Are you for the? I know. Today, it's kids? Life imitating art. I know. Um, I think that was the answer. I think it was. A I think that was it. Route. I think that was it. Yeah. Take that, Gary. Anyway, <laughs> now that I've now that I've disclosed this, DJ, I love everything you do. I've been a lifelong fan, and hearing all this greatness came from one gentleman is amazing. <laughs> um. Before we begin, and before I ask you of how one comes up, or are you afraid of the dark? Just, just for the fact that this show is called You, Me, and YTV, and we tend on this show to talk about '90s shows and Canadian shows. It is fascinating that this is one of let one of the best shows ever to be shot in Montreal, one of the best uh, Canadian uh, produced shows. But this is essentially an american show that was filmed in canada and wasn't even embraced by ytv until its second season is that correct yeah this is i mean everyone calls it a canadian show and and in many ways it was because we shot it and can shot it in montreal where you live um so many of the very talented people who worked on the show are canadians and live in canada um but the show did not originate in canada it, it uh, my partner ned and i we're, we're not canadians um it, it originated and was developed by nickelodeon in the states and uh when there was one day that uh you know we i wrote a couple of scripts and we're all set to go and they're loving the show and all that kind of good stuff it's like yeah, yeah and they called yeah. us into the office and we're like here we go we're gonna make a show here yay and we sat down they said we love your show like, yay we want to make your show yay we don't want to pay for your show what what <laughs> what they're like yeah we only want to pay for half of it because we only want the show to be on Nickelodeon. That's all we care about. And there's a value to the show and the rest of the world. So if you can come up with the other half of the money, we'll do the show. So my brilliant part. So we were just like, ah. Uh, so my brilliant partner, Ned. Submitted uh, for the approval of Midnight Society. Yeah. I call this story the slashed budget. The slashed, <laughs> but the, the half budget, frankly. Yeah. Um, and so uh, my brilliant partner, Ned, if not, if he hadn't done this, he went to, uh, he knew of this company in, in Montreal called Sinar, which okay. made cartoons. Um, and they were also international distributors of their cartoons. Um, so, and they had not done anything live action. So he said, we got the show. We got half the budget. Uh, will you put in the other half? And for the other half, you get to have international distribution. And they're like, sure. So, um, the reason we shot it in Canada is because Sinar, they wanted to put in half the money, but they didn't really want to put in half the money. Okay. They wanted to get all sorts of tax credits from the Canadian government. And so there are all sorts of criteria you have to do. So, and one of them is shooting in Canada. Okay. Um, okay. So that's why we ended up in Canada, but it was a Nickelodeon show. And they had to then going to what you said, they had to sell it in Canada because it didn't originate with a Canadian uh, 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 broadcaster. So they went to uh at some point early on, they went to YTV to say, hey, we got this show. You want to license it? You want to put it on YTV? And they're like, no, no, we don't like it. This is not very good. This is not what we like to do. And it's like, uh-oh. So, Blasphemy. I know. It's like, really? 
So, so yeah. they Cinar went to, I don't know if it still exists or if it's still around, but a smaller uh, broadcast network called called Family Channel in yeah. Canada, and they said, "Would you like it?" And they're like, "Yeah, we want it." <laughs> so, so they sold the first season to Family Channel or licensed the first season to Family Channel, uh, and it didn't air until much longer after it was on Nickelodeon. Um, but then once YTV saw the show, they're like. Oh, <laughs> that's what it. Oh, okay, we'll take it now. So, starting in the second season, yeah, it was on YTV ever since then. So, it's like, so, why uh, is Family Channel kicking our ass? And <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So that that's fascinating. Like you know, but you know, it, it, I find the show right off the bat, like, uh, really knew its voice, and you must have co. Uh, you must have gone into this project really knowing what it was supposed to be. Now, how long was Are You Afraid of the Dark in your head before it actually reached uh, the screen? It was a couple of years. Yeah. Um, it, the origination was my partner, Ned. Uh, he had actually hired me to write um, a series called Encyclopedia Brown, Boy Detective. Yeah. Adaptation of those books. It was yeah. for HBO. And, um, and, he, and he hired me based on an ABC after school special I wrote. Which I don't know if you got after school special. Oh, that's before your time. You wouldn't know these things. But there, there's really earnest hour long shows about kids going through issues and like teen teens going through issues. Yeah. And uh, and I wrote this really heartfelt earnest thing about the separation of church and state and all this kind of stuff. And somehow Ned saw this thing and he extrapolated from that that I'd be able to write a silly mystery about a boy detective. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I'm not sure I get, but he was right, frankly. Um, so we did Encyclopedia Brown, and after that, he said, "You know, let's let's come up with our own show." And and so we did, and we called it Scary Tales, and we took it to Nickelodeon, and Nickelodeon said no, kind of yeah. like YTV said no. <laughs> They're like, "No, you can't scare little kids." Uh, so we went away, and this was probably 1989, something like that, 1990. Mm. And then uh, a year later, we went back to Nickelodeon with another show to try to sell it to them, which they said no. <laughs> Oh, great. But then they said, but you know, that scary tale show. Did mm -hmm. anybody? Because uh... literally what had happened was I had like a three page thing that outlined what the whole talk about. I had it in my head, a three page thing that outlined pretty much. And I ran across it not that long ago. And it pretty much the show held true to that three page overview of what this thing was about. And uh, they said no. And they stuck it into the dead letter file, you know, the, put it in the back in the archive someplace, you know, Indiana Jones, where the arc is, you know, they put it back there someplace. And then in the interim between pitching that show and pitching this other show, uh, they hired a new executive. His name was Jay Mulvaney, who okay. Okay. was a development guy. And and he was going through the files like, gee, what is, what is, what else? He was bored one day. I don't know. <laughs> he was like, let's see what, what things have been turned down. Oh, let's see the scary tales thing. What's this? This is a three-page thing. And he read it and he's like, how, how come we're not doing this? And so he went to his bosses and said, uh, did, were you asleep that day? Did you not? <laughs> did you what? <laughs> this is gold. And so that's when we pitched that other show and they said, no, they said, so is that scary tales thing still available? And we're like, well, yeah, it is. And so that's how it came. So it was like a couple of year process that, that it took. Wow. And, Not uh, even counting going up to Canada. So it was a couple of years before we even got to Canada. And uh, the inspiration behind this, uh, do do I detect any Twilight Zone or uh, Trilogy of Terror or anything like that? Trilogy, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. you know Trilogy of Terror? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. That's that's a classic. I interviewed Don Mancini, the creator of Chucky, on uh, one of my other shows. And uh, he mentioned that the main influence of uh, Chucky was um, a Twilight Zone episode called... Oh. Um, hi, I'm da, 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 da. like, oh, I can't remember the doll's name, but anyway, the doll from the Twilight Zone and that crazy doll from Trilogy of Terror, like the voodoo doll that uh, comes to life and stabs <laughs> people in the legs. Awesome. Yeah, that doll's so awesome. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Are You For The Dark? What what inspired you? What was your uh, Are You For The Dark uh, growing up, I guess? Things yeah. you wouldn't, exp well, yeah. a million things. I mean, yeah. it's not one thing. Sure, the Twilight Zone is obviously a huge one. And, and that's, it's probably the most direct correlation because- one thing I always say when we're, I'm talking about the show is that really, in spite of the fact it's called, are you afraid of the dark? The, the goal wasn't just to scare the crap out of little kids. Okay. Um, that was one of the goals, but it wasn't the main goal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I always envisioned the show to be more twilight zone like and twilight zone, frankly, wasn't all that scary. 
it no, was just no. weird and it was strange and it was unsettling and odd things happened and ironic things happened um so that was more what i was emulating and as a little kid growing up, I, I I loved short stories. I loved short, scary stories. So I just ate those up and, and scary movies. And I'm not a big horror fan, frankly. Uh, I'm more of a mystery ghost spooky fan. Mm -hmm. and, and my mother, I don't know how much it was nature, how much it was nurture. She loved those stories. She called them ooh yeah stories. And so she'd read me these scary stories when I was a kid. And so I, I ate, all the, ate up all these magazine stories and short stories and um and there was also, and this is kind of a weird connection, but there was a TV show on in the late 60s. Um, of all things, it was a Western. Okay. It was called, still is called, uh, The Wild Wild West. Yeah. It was made into a movie with Will Smith, which was not very good. But but it was an awesome show. And one of the reasons it was an awesome show, it was kind of like, it was a Western. I wasn't a really big Western fan, but it really wasn't a Western because it was almost like James Bond in the Wild West. Yeah, but the stories that came out of that series were so odd, and the villains were so weird. And the sometimes it was ghosts, and sometimes it was magical. And even though it was about these two cowboy Secret Service agents who were trying to stop people, um, and in fact, there was a character, a recurring character in the Wild Wild West that was my inspiration for Doctor Vink in uh, in Are You Afraid of the Dark? His name was uh, Doctor Miguelito Loveless. <laughs> Doctor, you know, I don't know what doctor he kind of doctor he was. I don't know what kind of doctor Dr. Vink was, frankly. He wasn't a doctor of love, that's for sure. No, he's not a doctor of love. Um, and I doubt if he was a PhD either, but yeah, whatever. Um, so the, and and Miguelito Lovis was a character that came back once or twice a season on the Wild Wild West and always had some bizarre plot that he had going. And so I said, like, Boy, I would love to create a character like that. And that's where Dr. Vink came from. So so really the inspiration for Arif Dark came from a lot of different sources. It wasn't just let's scare kids and put a boogeyman of the week. It was like, let's tell some really weird stories that that I mean there's you know, love stories and there's ghost stories and there's vampires and there's every and every season has a whole kind of array of different types of stories. And so that was really more the, the goal inspired by so many different sources that's what i loved about the show i loved the fact that it was kind of a mixed bag when it came to uh you know it all felt like it was from the same series but i loved how each camper had their own perspective and their own uh type of feel that they would bring to an episode like gary's was much more magic based and uh other ones were um eric from the first season in fact i have a question from a fan who actually asked why was eric like you know not just replaced but uh, considering he was just in one season, but uh, is that is that because I'm assuming because it's like, well, it's more interesting to bring in a whole brand new character who has that perspective of storytelling. Is that uh, well, it, it, first part of it is, yeah, I tried to have each of the characters tell the kind of story, you know, create a persona from their character that you always kind of knew the kind of story they would tell. And and each year, I mean, the true Midnight Society were the writers of the show. Because they're the ones who were coming up with the stuff. I mean, I was one of them, um, and and so it was my job to to find stories and then have that writer write the stories. And the reason why, and so the thing that was so great about that is that it wasn't like there was a writers' room with four people sitting around trying to say, "Oh, what are we going to write about now?" It, yeah. it we weren't hiring. I wasn't hiring writers. I was finding stories. So that gave opened the world to people pitching me all these great stories yeah. and different storytellers. So, so you're right. So each one had its own style of this, the writer who was doing it, but it was my job as the showrunner to kind of homogenize it, to make it, are you afraid of the dark? Like, so I got the best of whatever that unique storyteller's voice was. I mean, the writer's mm -hmm. voice, um, and then homogenize it. So it felt like, are you afraid of the dark? And then <laughs> the third step of that was, Hmm. Which one of the Midnight Society kids would tell this story? <laughs> you know, I, it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like uh, I need a Frank story. You know, it was it was who who would tell this story, and then I try to put it with that person. Uh, as for for uh, Eric, I got you know, I, I'm an old guy. I've been around a long time, and and you don't think that decisions that you made 30 years ago would come back to haunt you 30 years later. <laughs> Um, I mean, when, whenever you're making a show, you always try to, years ago, this very year, this very year, it's like a legend has it. Mm. So, I mean, when you're doing a show, when anybody's doing a show, you, you, you put your best foot forward, you make the decisions that you think are right in the moment, 
but it isn't until years later you realize, oh my God, those decisions live on. <laughs> they don't go away. <laughs> you made them in the moment, but they live on forever. The, the decision with Eric was um, twofold. Um, one was the, the actor who played Eric, he kind of didn't really want to just be in the Midnight Society. He, okay. he wanted to do more. He wanted to be in episodes. And that wasn't the show. So it didn't really work. Um, so combine that with the fact that I originally conceived the Midnight Society to have seven kids. I directed that first season of Midnight Society. There were too many kids. It was okay. like it was like herding cats. They were just and and everybody had to have at least two stories. I mean, if yeah. seven kids, thirteen episodes. Somebody's going to get shortchanged. So it made sense to have six characters. So everybody gets at least two stories per season, and it was easier to negotiate just blocking and moving around and whatnot. Um, but where I made the so the, that was the right decision that not to bring Eric back um, and to reduce and not replace him. Those are the right decisions. The stupid decision that if I knew then what I know now, uh, I, I would. <laughs> my thinking at the time, think about this. We did a first season of a show. I had no idea that anybody was even watching this show. <laughs> I, it, you know, I was up in Montreal. I wasn't looking at ratings. I was, all I know is I was no. delivering a show and they Nickelodeon said they liked it. And so I was like, okay. And here's. So now getting to the second season, or the writing of the second season. And I'm faced with the Eric issue. So I was like, okay, we'll just drop Eric out. And no one's going to care. No one's even going to recognize that he's gone. There's yeah. so many kids there. You know, it's like a team photo. No one's going to know. So I did not address it at all. Big mistake. Wow. Because here we are 30 years later, people saying, what happened to Eric? What's going on? I, I learned that lesson much sooner than 30 years later. I learned that lesson a couple years later because <laughs> uh, two other actors dropped out of the show and I was going to replace them. So I thought I can't just have them disappear. So I just added all, all it took was a line. It was a simple one line where Gary says, well, things change and people will move on and David and Kristen have moved, but now we can have some new kids. <laughs> That's all it took. And so no one was saying what happened to David and Kristen. <laughs> it was, because I addressed it. I could yeah. easily have said, Eric died. You know, that's all I had Eric was said. mysteriously killed in the woods after a meeting. He was eaten by a bear on the way home from a meeting. That's all it would have taken was one line. And now here we are, 30 yeah. years later, I'm answering the question. It's like, it's my fault. I should have I should have explained where Eric went. I, I truly did not think anyone would care or notice, but they have. <laughs> Uh, this is interesting. So um, they were saying, I think I remember reading that Ryan Gosling was supposed to be originally in the Midnight Society. Is that true, DJ? Uh, well, I don't know if he was supposed to be, but I wanted him to be. Okay. Uh, we uh, This is going into the series. We made a pilot in 1991, and it aired on Nickelodeon in 1991. Then in 1992, mm -hmm. we got the pickup for the series. And we really kind of started from scratch. So we started with a whole new Midnight Society. It's one of the beauties of doing a pilot is you can kind of – you know, kind of ring things out, see what works, see what doesn't work. So we're like, well, you know, let's let's just look at every kid in the Midnight Society. Let's start from scratch. So we actually brought back one kid, a uh, guy played Gary, Ross Hull, actually played David in the pilot. Okay. Um, we, we brought him back and we made him Gary. Yeah, I know Ross. I know Ross. Ross was the first guest ever on this show, actually. Ever. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, and I think it was five or six years ago this very month. Very but, uh, month. Yeah, yeah, legend has it that he was the first guest. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so so he came back as Gary, um, and so we had recap. So some oh, so suddenly the Midnight Society became a bigger thing because you know the way I was first seeing it, it's like oh, this is just the the wraparounds, but it's like oh no, people want to know who the Midnight Society is, so we paid closer attention, and uh, I wanted to hire Ryan Gosling to be David. Um, however, he, he got another gig. Um, he got the gig to be on the new Mickey Mouse Club, which shot in Florida. I don't know if it was a smart decision on his part, 
because <laughs> he had to share the screen with Christina Aguilera and Justin Timberlake and uh, 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 oh, Britney Spears. I don't know if she's still around. I think all the other child stars have probably signed a contract in blood, assuring yeah, immortality and, and, and fame. Became <laughs> monster hits, including <laughs> Ryan. Yeah. Um, so that show went for a couple seasons, but and he lives in Montreal, so lived in Montreal, and he came back. And we're like, hey, there's that kid that we like so much. He's, his show was canceled. <laughs> Let's get him back. So, so then we got him in an episode. But at the time, he was doing a lot of the, the circuit of kids show. I think he was in Goosebumps episodes and a couple of other things, too. So, uh, so yeah. But I originally wanted him to be in the Midnight Society. And he turned us down. Oh. Probably a really savvy move on his part, frankly. So, yeah. So that is true. I guess because he can be in a tail and then kind of leave, you know, and be available and... Uh... You know. for, for for all actors, but kids in particular, it was the greatest gig in the world. I mean, we shot those shows in five days. That was it. They come oh, in. Okay. They they have some fun for a week. It's like going to camp for a week, and then they yeah. go away. It's not that grind of week after week after week. And oh, so yeah, every kid was, I think, every kid who was on that show just had a blast playing on that show. Even the Midnight Society, we shot those all together in two weeks. That, that was it. Uh, we shoot one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and boop, and they're they were out. So it was it was a pretty easy gig and fun gig for for actors, especially for the kids. For sure, uh, we have a comment here. We have a comment from Facebook from Dylan Smith says, "Are you for the Are you for the dark t uh, TV show? It was totally awesome." Well, I agree, and what most of and all the viewers are going to be seeing this, so completely agree too. Uh, Carl C has this question. Uh, how were you able? How were you able to find actors, actresses to be part of the Midnight Society in the episode stories? Um, I'm guessing, like you, you know, did you import anybody, or was it just Canadian actors? Um, the yes and yeah, yes and no. Yes, we imported a lot of actors, but okay. given what I said before about Sinar wanting to get all these tax credits, we we had to go Canadian first. Um, there's a whole point system and whatnot. And so we were allowed to bring in a certain number of actors. Like um, there were a few Midnight Society members who were from the United States. Um, uh, Samantha, uh, Joanna Garcia was from Florida. Um, Quinn, uh, I forgot where Quinn was from. So there were a couple of United States actors. But what yeah. I would do is every season, once I had scripts, uh, I live in Los Angeles and I do the junket. I'd start in Los Angeles and I audition kids in Los Angeles. Then I go to Vancouver, then I go to Toronto. I go down to New York and then I go up to Montreal, uh, seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. So, th so that's where they all came from. And, and it was, uh, it was a fairly low budget show. So besides the Canadian content issue, um, kids who lived in Montreal got first dibs because yeah. they didn't have to travel <laughs> and we didn't have to put them up in hotels and all that kind of stuff. So we tried to work with Montreal first and then we work out from there. Um, one funny thing happened. It wasn't so funny at the time, but um, I did that junket. It was before one of the seasons. And I landed in Montreal, ended in Montreal where we shot. And then one night, the first night I was there, I had this horrible fever. Just, it was terrible. Like, oh my God, I was like delirious. I was, wow. I was like, I'm already afraid of the dark. It was terrible. And I went to bed in the hotel that night and I woke up the next day and I took a shower and I stood in front of the mirror and I saw a spot on my chest. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I called the production doctor and I said, I think I have the chicken pox. And she was like, no, you don't. You don't have the chicken pox. I was like, no, no, I've never had the chicken pox. You just forgot. No, no, I've never had the chicken pox. I think I have the chicken pox. Was like, <laughs> so she came over to the hotel. She goes, okay, you don't have the chicken pox. I lifted my shirt. She goes, oh my God, you have the chicken pox. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go into quarantine for like 10 days because I was communicable with chicken pox and I traced it back, you know, the incubation period. I think I got it in Vancouver. Okay. I think it was probably one of those kids that I saw in Vancouver. Oh, those little I can't believe it. Disease. This Virginia. is why you don't work with animals and children. I know. So, so yeah, so we, we would put the, we saw people from all over and sometimes tapes would come in uh, from all over. So, and the thing too, about our afraid of that, it was an anthology show. So we needed a lot of kids. We needed yeah, a lot of adults of too. So, and not, and a lot of the kids were incredibly experienced and really great, like uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Some of them they weren't so experienced, they weren't so great. So, but it was like, it was almost like, can you stand up and not fall down? You're in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there were just so many kids we needed. Of course, oh, yeah. of course. Um, 
speaking of well kids and actors i mean you know locations and shooting around montreal and there's only so many places you can make look like different places on uh, so many episodes but uh one of your episodes called uh, the frozen ghost was shot at a bed and breakfast that my family owns in hudson called rivers mead seriously and, yeah and the funny thing about it dj this is a true story um i was watching a vhs because uh, a friend a uh, I won a VHS at a birthday party in which the kid's dad worked for Sinar. And I won this VHS over you for the dark. And I had the, the shiny red bicycle, the frozen ghost and the field of fear music video. I have mm -hmm. it somewhere right now, kids. I'm just telling you right now, uh, M Melissa, my girlfriend of 10 and a half years. Some of you know, or some of you know her as Morgan from radioactive or Sonia from the, uh, go the renegade virus episode. Um, she's, she's at home using the internet for work. So here I am once again in my parents' basement wearing flannel. So it is 1993 all over again. <laughs> uh, um, but I was watching this VHS that I acquired from this, uh, birthday party that nobody else had because you had to have been there to have one of these tapes, uh, back in the day, it's not easy to buy one of these tapes. Um, and I'm watching the frozen ghost episode in the freaking place that it was shot. And a family member walks in and says, that's here. <laughs> that's the kitchen wait was that what they were shooting yeah yeah that's the place and i'm like and i'm a i'm 10 10 or 11 and your parents own this b and b my uh my my dad's cousins yeah my okay. dad's cousins all own this airbnb oh not airbnb yeah, b and no, back in the day when it was one and yeah. uh the funny thing about that is that i was like 10 years old i'm like wait a second melissa joan hart was in this house I immediately went upstairs and started smelling all the pillows. I was a very strange <laughs> kid. Very strange okay. kid. I was a very strange young man. But uh, <laughs> I'm 37 now, and there's no more smelling of pillows. Trust me. <laughs> but uh, it was just so surreal to be. And then that wall broke. And then I realized, oh, right. There's probably sets and locations for all these episodes. You know, things you don't think of when you're 9 or 10 or 11 years old. So, um, yeah. what? Tell me about scouting locations in Montreal and trying to make everywhere look like it's not montreal canada <laughs> right well yeah. the, uh it, that was no small task because i because i will say like people say oh uh, are you afraid of dark was a canadian show um it, it it wasn't really a canadian show but if it to the extent that it was it was a french canadian show yeah. because it's a it's montreal it's quebec and and most of our crew were, were French Canadians, so so there is a very different sensibility, a French sensibility, than there is an English sensibility, um, and I think that it, to our uh, advantage, I think it mm. gave the art direction of the show. Real Pru is the art director, so it gave a really interesting design and look to the show, and that was really kind of the, the French uh, uh, influence. Yeah. Um, what one of the things I would do? It's, it's funny you ask that question. That. Um, you, it's again the budget was low on the show so of course we needed schools and we needed houses like the the b and b um and we needed woods mm. there's an arboretum that we shot outside of montreal which which was a total nightmare because because it was an arboretum which meant it was protected which meant we couldn't spray for mosquitoes which meant we all had like mosquito netting on the whole time and it was just like it was horrible because the mosquitoes were like the size of robins it was scary um but what I would do is during the writing process, I would go to Montreal with the location manager and I'd say, show me cool stuff. Cause yeah. Montreal is a very cool city. It's a very unique city. It's a lovely city. It's, it's not like any typical American type city um, with the architecture. And it's, it's really wonderful. I love Montreal. And so she would just take me and show me cool things. And a lot of times I would kind of re-engineer a story based on a location. Um, the, the one, the obvious one that springs to mind was, um, she took me to this 1930s, 1940s era water treatment facility, really low tech type thing. And, and it was, but it was really cool looking. It was really old and they had all these tanks of water that I don't know what they were treating it for, yeah. but, but it was really visually stunning and whatnot. And I thought, Oh, I could write a story about this. It's like, what if what if these tanks were incubators? What if they were growing things in these tanks? Nice. And so from that grew the story called The Hatching, where where there's the school run by lizard people, and <laughs> they had these tanks with floated with eggs that they were Aren't incubating they all? things. <laughs>
<laughs> and the kids were my control and they were feeding yeah. eggs. So, so that kind of was the location came first. And, and I remember, I forgot what show, it might've been that episode where I was talking to the DP and we we're in some wacky place and he's lighting it. And he's like, how do you find these places? <laughs> the basements, the weirdness. I'm like, it's not like I came up with the idea. Oh, let's do a giant underwater multiple tanks that we have to then build in order to do the story. We could never have done that, but it already existed. So a lot of times stories are based on things that existed. Uh, there was one school uh, in downtown Montreal that we shot at quite a bit. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the school, but it was a really old building. Um, and it had the greatest basement. There was all full of boilers and weird things. I don't even think they were working anymore. We shot so many episodes down there. Nice, like nice. It, it, Once it doubled for the hospital basement in, a, in an episode called The Night Shift, where uh, the, a vampire sent itself to a, a hospital. And so we, so that was the, the – it was the school. So we shot in the school all the time. And we shot in every school. It, it, one of the challenges was signage. Um, we had it, you know, because we couldn't see French signs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was that we, um, one interesting thing is we shot in a lot of cemeteries and there are a lot of cemeteries in Montreal, that there um, are. but on the mountain there, there are actually two big cemeteries and I'm forgetting the names of them, but one's a Catholic cemetery and one's a, just a generic Christian cemetery. And they're right next to each other. They're literally, yeah, they're, I mean, they share the same yeah coffins, whatever. Um, <laughs> And they're right next to each other. And so we wanted to shoot an episode in, in the Catholic cemetery. Because if I remember, it was a little more cool, gothic-y looking. It had more weird things. Um, but they wouldn't let us do it. Uh, they mean people around the cemetery. And the reason they wouldn't do it is we have nothing against shooting an episode in the cemetery. It's that as Catholics, we don't believe in ghosts. So if you want to shoot a funeral scene for an episode of a show, knock yourself out. But if you're saying there's ghosts here, you can't do it. So we had to go, okay, thank you very much. Boop. <laughs> Move over to the other cemetery where they're like, yeah, sure, ghosts. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Whatever you want. There ghosts, are many we got tons. We got tons. In fact, it's haunted in just case you're interested. Um, Catholics, they don't believe in this, but let me tell you, it's haunted. <laughs> um, there are many a morning where we'd wake up as the sun's coming up in the cemetery, having breakfast and bagels on tombstones <laughs> because we're shooting in the cemetery all night. But that was that was all in, in Montreal on the, on the mount there. Amazing! That's that's amazing, man. There's um a really interesting comment that I just want to pull up that somebody said. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to paraphrase. Sorry, because there's so many. But uh, they said. That uh, are you afraid of the dark set the bar so high for shows that were similar that would follow, and I thought that was interesting because I remember when Goosebumps came out, I was like you know pretty keen on you afraid of the dark already. So it's interesting. I had read Goosebumps, the entity of Goosebumps that was the original books, and seeing it turn into a show. Whoever saw the show first, I'm assuming, would probably be like, wow, it's a show. Okay, cool. But to me, all I kept thinking of was like, man, they changed a lot to squeeze this thing on television. <laughs> but Are You For The Dark never had that problem. And whenever someone says for fun, you know, Goosebumps versus Are You For The Dark, I'm like, Are You For The Dark? The show is its purest version. It's really its only version. And it was written, as you said, to kind of accommodate your budget and your location and your actors. I mean, you weren't giving any of these kids that you were kind of finding off the street soliloquies to memorize you know what i mean <laughs> right. like that i always found that i always found that fascinating and that uh you know the, the debate doesn't exist but as someone who uh you know created the show or you for the dark when you saw other shows that were similar come out afterwards did you find it flattering or did you say hey <laughs> hey i did that yeah, yeah. um well i i it, mm. I can't say I've seen many of them. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a Goosebumps episode all the way through. Um, one thing that I do know about Goosebumps, I did see the movie Goosebumps. Um, the movie is, I find better than books because I had more than five bucks to pull off like, you know, <laughs> right. a hundred pages of a large imaginative, you know, right. CGI, big explode splash page, whatever. But yeah. And it had Jack Black and that was, that was cool. Of course. Um, yeah. I always felt that the, the essential difference between those two shows is that um, Goosebumps always felt a little more tongue in cheek. Um, it, it was a little more it, it parody is the wrong word, but it was it was more 
you weren't far away from a laugh all the time. So everything was kind of a heightened reality. Um, where Are You Afraid of the Dark had some legit emotional stories. Um, they're yeah. written where adults could could relate to them as well. Um, so Are You Afraid of the Dark was really a bit more earnest, if you will, where Goosebumps was a bit more tongue-in-cheek. There, there were a couple of episodes we did that I thought, oh, that, that's more of like goosebump style but that was okay because yeah, yeah. we did so many different things so that was fine so um so i never I, you know i in answer to your question i never really looked at any there and there are a handful of other shows that have come out since but um for whatever reason none have really risen to the popularity of either are you afraid of dark or goosebumps i mean yeah. i think I mean, if you talk purely the number of eyeballs that saw the Goosebumps show, there are far more that saw Goosebumps than saw Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, yeah, and, but you kind of carved out the world for it to sit in while, you know, you had to forge your show in fire, essentially, because yeah, well, nobody sure. wanted it at first, you know? like I, and, yeah. and also, but, well, yes and no. I mean, you're right, they did. But, but the Goosebumps, as you pointed out, the Goosebumps books did exist already. They were yeah, hugely yeah. popular. So it Very was a popular. franchise that yeah, already yeah. existed as well as it was on broadcast TV. Hmm. So it was on, it was into every home yeah. where, uh, I afraid the dark was on Nickelodeon and, and YT family channel Wild TV, which was, it, it, it was really kind of still the beginning of cable TV. <laughs> Not everyone had cable TV. And, and so to this day, I talk to people, they say, oh, you, you did a show back in the 90s? I'm like, yeah, it was on Nickelodeon. He goes, oh, we didn't get cable. Uh, so, so the universe of who could see Are You Afraid of the Dark was way smaller of course. than who saw a broadcast show, which is Goosebumps. So, um, but, and people say, you know, you look back on, did Goosebumps copy you or whatever? No, they didn't. But also, we were around for a couple of years before Goosebumps came out. So it's course. like we were... We were we were our own thing <laughs> and doing our thing, and then Goosebumps came out, so it wasn't even a. Wasn't as even. a reader of many Goosebump books uh, as a kid, and you know, I read four of them in a day <laughs> when doing some research or something because I realized the the font is very big. <laughs> right, I read eighty pages. It's four yeah, words. Yeah, exactly. I used to think I'm like I read I read a Goosebump book in a day. That means I'm an amazing reader, right? And these days I'm just like, Jesus, kid, only one. Um, <laughs> any, anyway, I, I definitely can say that it did not have that emotional, re none of these stories really had that emotional resonance or would take the time to give you that kind of emotional resonance because Goosebump essentially was kind of a jump scare book. And every yeah. chapter would have to have a jump scare. And are you for the dark? Although some moments were insanely scary for to me as a kid, yeah. Yeah. including the one... And Brett Wilson, I'm, I think you know him too. He yeah. wrote that book, Scary Tales, mm -hmm. an illustrated history of a year for the dark. I pledged that Kickstarter and I have the book back at home, not my parents' basement, in which I dwell currently <laughs> this evening. But um, anyhow, he one of his favorite episodes, and he knows the episode numbers more than I do, of course. Uh, he but knows more than I do too. So. There you go. Brett Wilson, God bless you. Um, the my favorite the one of the things that scared me the most was definitely like when they put the stuff in the pool and then you finally saw this invisible ghost that was terrifying everybody and it just emerging out of the water i'm like wow for a kid's show you guys had balls <laughs> i know it was a uh, as, as much as i say that our our goal wasn't to scare kids no but, um, you, but you there were some you've, episodes that the goal was to scare kids <laughs> it was just so. like I mean, every season, I'd say, yeah. what, you know, what, let's get a whole variety of types of shows. Yeah. And a couple of those were, this is going to be a monster. Yeah. <laughs> Where there's going to be a, a boogeyman they're going to be running away from. And so, and that was that one for that episode. Oh, uh, right before, um, we're going to talk about the emotional, uh, you know, uh, Resonance, Are You Afraid of the Dark has? But just since we're just talking cool episodes, I got to mm -hmm. say, before the Marvel Universe started making four comic book movies a year, and I was just literally d like dehydrated for comic book entertainment in the nineties, the ghastly grinner episode really stuck with me because it was about a comic book and a comic book artist and seeing a villain come to life. Like, Oh my God, that was like one of the coolest episodes ever. And still to this day, people always bring him up and uh, he's art, he's art, he's fan busts. There's tattoos. It's an, it's insane. How some of these characters have lived on and on and on. That, that was 
the cast of Greener was a creation of, uh, of Ron Oliver, who directed a lot of episodes. Uh, he really, in many ways, set the tone. In the first season of the show, he and I switch off back and forth directing the episodes. And, and he wrote a couple of episodes, one of which is The Ghastly Grinners. That was his baby. And, and I just heard something the other day that I, I didn't know. Yeah, say that whenever you do a TV show the, the, or a movie, the result is a, a conglomeration of the input of a lot of creative people. And um, they all have a little bit that they put into it. And um, one of the people that is just the most amazing person, thank God we found her, was a woman by the name of Anique Chartier, who's from Montreal, who's our makeup artist. And she created pretty much 95% of all the monsters in the show. And she was making nice. it up as she was going along. And so she created the Ghastly Grinner, along with Claire Nadon, who did the costume for the Ghastly Grinner. Who drew um, the comic? Who drew the comics? I've been trying to find this on Google for like a year. Somebody asked me that recently, and I didn't know. But this guy, you know, online guy, and he tracked down the person who did the comic and got the original mock-up of, of the, the comic book. So Amazing. It, I, I wish I could tell you. I don't know who it I was. Um, and I just heard this the other day. We did a thing with Brett, actually. Uh, it was a bunch of people who worked on the show got together, one of whom was Anique, and we yeah. talked about the Ghastly Grinner. And apparently, uh, I don't know if she was talking about me or Ron. I don't remember. <laughs> but <laughs> but she, but one of us wanted the Ghastly Grinner to be white like the Joker. You know, okay. kind of pasty, scary white, because it was about the time that that Batman Joker movie had come out, yeah. and uh, and she's like, "No, you don't want to do that. That's that's it's been done. It's like let's make him yellow." And we're like, "Yellow, really?" And she goes, "No, trust me, it'll be great." So she's the one that gave that look, the Gaslight Grinner look, and then her and Claire that did the costume with the same color of the cut. So it's amazing. And I love the fact that we had those discussions thirty years ago, whatever it was. And today, people are getting tattoos of, of the Ghastly Grinner on their arm. <laughs> I think that's so great. Uh, me, me too, honestly. That, uh, the clown from Laughing in the Dark, like, it's, um, oh, that, that's a freaky one. Laughing in the Dark, yeah. I, I A lot of episodes didn't have happy endings, too. Like, usually, these and these days, everybody needs to be coddled. And <laughs> they have to have <laughs> instant, res instant uh, resolution. And uh, they can't they can't leave you hanging, but I, I appreciate that. I think I grew up to be a stronger human because of that, <laughs> but also an empathetic human because Dylan Smith is saying, "Are you afraid of the dark episode? The tale of the last dance was a beautiful episode, and it really brought tears to my eyes." Were there any episodes that brought tears to your eyes, DJ? <sighs> I don't know if that brought tears to my eyes. There, there are a lot of episodes that brought tears to my eyes for reasons beyond the. <laughs> the emotion of it but but uh the, i'll tell you something brings tears to my eyes and i've said this before that um you know you look back on things you did a long time ago and and so much has been lost to the ages of memory and time and whatnot but there's some things that really stick with you and there's one moment mm. that it's not it's not a sad moment frankly it's more of a nostalgic moment that brings tears to my eyes um, and it's my favorite line of 91 episodes and it's the end, it's the very end, not the campfire end, but the tail end of laughing in the dark, the Zebo episode. And it's the Carney who's played by Aaron Tager, who just passed away not that long ago, who also played Dr. Vink actually. Um, he plays the Carney in this carnival fun house. And he's this kind of weird character who is this guy really Zebo? Is he not Zebo? And uh, he kind of lures the kid in to do the stuff he's going to do. And when it gets to the end and the kid brings a nose back to the clown and he escapes finally and the park is closed, but the kid escapes and he runs away. And then the, the carny Aaron just comes on to the screen and he's got a cigar like Zebo, And he says, it's the most fun in the park when you're laughing in the dark. That line brings tears to my eyes. He says it earlier in the show. Yeah. Uh, but then when he comes back and then he laughs, but just that line typifies, are you afraid of the dark to me? And the way his delivery is just so perfect. So yeah, that's, that line brings tears to my eyes. Caroline, oh, uh, that's, um, speaking of Caroline, uh, you got a great question. I'm about to ask it, but I just got to do in our comment, like once again, just a, just a person who has followed this series and just, you know, uh, remembers the way it made me feel. But I got to tell you, DJ, when I really rewatch it, 
I kind of like, you know, sometimes you're a kid and you like something and you're like, you know, you get lost, you get lost in it. And it's because nothing else is on. I honestly, <laughs> I honestly was rewatching it and just thinking about what a quality program it was and understanding the more older I get, I'm um, like circumstances, budget, kid acting, all these things in your way, essentially, and still to make something so great. Like, I actually honestly really do think it's a it's a beautiful, wonderful show and moments like um, and forgive me, fans, I'm not really good with uh, the names of the episodes, but it's when a girl moves into an apartment and her only friend is this lonely old lady that lives down the hall. And then she ends up making some new friends and she's supposed to hang out with this sweet old lady. And she says, I just don't want to be alone that day. But here, lo and behold, your friend, uh, you, she makes some kids uh, friends that are kids her age they invite her to a concert i remember being young and being very enticed by the same things and you might think oh maybe i don't have to go to this house and then when she gets back in the house and the our apartment is empty and then you just see the old woman in the dark she's like you were supposed to be here this is the day i died and i like to this day dude i'm 37 i watched this two weeks ago and i almost pissed my pants <laughs> I'm like, that is old people are horrifying <laughs> <laughs> old people are hard. that's no, I'm, the moral I'm, totally, of that. I'm totally kidding but no, old dead um, people are horrifying I, 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 the instant guilt of thinking oh my god did i ever do that kind of stuff too because it's a very humanistic plot because this is a very nice girl but we're all kind of like you know tempted by the feeling of belonging and friendship and all that other stuff so yeah well, well talking about that that points out two things mm -hmm. that, that you touched on already one is um the twilight zone connection twilight zone were was were the twilight zone episodes were morality tales usually when something went south for somebody if they ended up in the twilight zone because they did something they probably shouldn't have done and it comes back to haunt them and send them into the twilight zone and that's a lot of are you afraid of the dark where kids don't usually it's not just something random that happens to a kid it's something that they were involved in maybe not that they're bad kids it's just that something happened in their lives that triggered this thing to happen and that's straight out of twilight zone um the other thing is you mentioned about the not don't all have happy endings. Um, I don't claim to be a, an expert on all things Twilight Zone, but I can think of only one, count them, one Twilight Zone episode that actually had a happy ending. They <laughs> all have bad endings. And, and, and you can't do that with a kid show. So so no. the kind of rhythm of an Ari Afraid of the Dark episode was um, there was always a moment of victory. There's a moment where the kids solve the mystery or break the curse or beat the boogeyman, you know, whatever it happens to be. So there's a moment of, ah, release. Then oftentimes there's that extra thing that happens where it's like, or maybe not. So so you do get the happy ending, but then there's that, oh, I didn't think so. And that is straight Twilight Zone. Um, awesome. And at some point, I, I, I not that I'm ever going to do this, but I, I wouldn't mind going back to find out how many endings actually are bad endings. And they're, they're probably a lot more than I can even think of. I mean, even something as simple as the hatching, the one I told you about where they're yeah. hatching the eggs. They beat the thing. They destroy the mother. They destroy the, the evil people. It's, yay, we won. All the eggs have been exploded. It's like, yay, we won. Let's get out of here. And then the camera just pans over, and there's one last egg that's kind of opening that hasn't hatched yet. Arguably, that's a bad ending. <laughs> so, and that's that's Twilight Zone for you. So, so yeah. I, oh, I, oh, oh, the other thing. I'm sorry. Oh, let me add one more thing. Please, dude. This is, this this is why is we're a, here. <laughs> this is a line in, in jumping off of, of that really nice thing you said about the show. Um, and it goes back to to the kinds of stories we did. Is that my partner Ned has a great line? I'll attribute this to him. People say, you know, how did you write these shows? How did, how did, what was your guide? Or, you know, what were you thinking? And his line was, and I love this line, he says, we write for adults and cast short people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all those stories have adult like things that adults can really, I mean, they're all kid centric, of course, but, but they're adult sentiments like that, that apartment 214. Oh my yeah, God, yeah. that was, that was, that was gut wrenching. It was. Yeah. 
so that's that's a very adult sentiment. So uh, so right for adults, cast short people. I'm not even I'm not even kidding. I mean, like I always got along with my grandparents and stuff like that. But I think I even maybe once or twice, like when something similar could have happened, I actually took the no, I'll go visit grandma, uh, nanny, like instead. You know, just kind of like had that patience that what a good kid. Yeah, it's not, had that patience that like um we you know when you're when you're young you don't have that kind of emotional intelligence yet and you don't, you're unaware that your actions can affect other people and you're just so busy absorbing the world and all the new information you're getting at all times and the vast amounts of insecurity some that we never grow out of um it's 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 hard to be selfless and i find tales of morality like this kind of help you along the way and um yeah, I, 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 I also learned from life lessons of another show you worked on called Ghost Rider. <laughs> <laughs> and and I got to I got to ask you right after right after this nice segue, because Caroline is bringing up something cool. She says, did creating Are You for the Dark prepare you for your present uh, young adult novel writing career? DJ, you do so much stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. Everything leads to something. I mean, it's all, it's the 10,000 hour rule. The more you write, the more, or the more you do anything, the better you get at it. So yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if there's a direct correlation between Are You Afraid of the Dark to Pendragon or Morpheus Road, whatever, but, but sure, the, the more you write, the better you get. So, so absolutely. Yeah. And, and as to why, as to why I write usually young protagonists, um, it goes back to what you said, Brian, um, I would say the average age of the protagonist I write about, whether it's on TV or books, is probably about 14 years old. And the reasons I do that, I think, is because, for one, when you get to be that age, you're starting to get old enough that you're no longer umbilical corded to your parents. You can actually exist in circles where your parents aren't there the whole time. So you can go on adventures that you're not being looked at all the time. Nowadays, I don't know if that's possible, but at least back then, you could go on adventures. Mm -hmm. But even more to the point, and this is what you said, is that when you're 14 or roughly that age, you think you know everything, but you really don't know anything. No. So so you're, I, I would offer the stories I want to tell, whether I have other writers or myself, it's like, I want stories about young people about that age who are going through some kind of issue in their lives that they're trying to sort out, they're trying to figure out. And it would be interesting to find out what happens to them, even if they didn't come across some spooky dooky thing. Uh, because then once you care about them, want to know what happens to them, then they get involved with the spooky dooky thing, then you're really with them. And then ideally the two conflicts will kind of grow and, and resolve themselves together. So that was really kind of the recipe for Are You Afraid of the Dark, where it's really interesting character stories that would be interesting even if they didn't find an invisible ghost in a pool. That's a good <laughs> point. That's a I good mean, not point. all are as dire as that lady in the bar. I mean, that was a pretty serious one, frankly. Some of them are a lot lighter than that, but it's all kid-relatable thing. And so so it's the eight, I mean, to, to use a phrase that's being rebooted again, it's the wonder years. It's the years where you're just starting to learn the kind of stuff you were talking about, to be responsive, to say, you know, maybe I should go visit grandma. She's not going to be around much longer or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I like to illustrate that in, in shows without being so, you know, didactic about this is what you should do. So it's more fun <laughs> rather than do a show about you should visit that old lady because she's all alone. <laughs> when you do a show like Are You Afraid of the Dark, it's like, if you don't visit the old lady, she's going to haunt you. <laughs> you're going to regret having done that. So you're being taught a lesson, but it's in the context of fun. Yeah, it's it's also um, – I also like how the show was told from the perspective of outsiders. Like uh, the dollhouse one was so cool because here's this girl staying with her cousin who's like a – so mean and so bossy to her friends and she's just this shy girl just trying to make her way and um ends up no wait i'm getting it wrong not the doll the dollhouse one is amazing you're, you're amazing mixing i'm mixing it up because what which is the one i think it's like episode two or three where the girl went missing and they're telling the story about how this girl couldn't talk and they chased her and locked her in a house but her parents were gone and she fucking like starved to death 
fuck. Sorry for scaring everybody. That's so dark. It's and, really dark. But 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 then she's like, I don't need a nanny, and she's pushing this old lady aside, and this old lady, uh, she, she well not that old to be honest and now that i'm a little older we had to age her up we had this actress actress that you aged up she um her performance is just stunning and the rejection she feels when she overhears this cruel cousin kind of dismissing her and saying she's useless because she is holding on to the idea that her daughter is gone and essentially she failed her and maybe staying around and keep taking care of another kid or other kids somehow can somehow help her find peace but it doesn't but the fact that you reunited them at the end in ghost world where they're both young and warm and they have color again and it's just like that is freaking beautiful and so not catholic apparently <laughs> well well talk about dark yeah. um is as beautiful and as heart warming and as wonderful and bittersweet <laughs> as it all is yeah that pretty much means that old lady died <laughs> when she went to that mirror <laughs> exactly yeah it's like you don't want to think too much about that but uh, no oh so, uh, but yeah. But at the same time, in my head, I'm just like, well, maybe she had like, you know, essentially it was like a willing heart attack or something. I I don't know. You oh, know what knows? I mean? Well, it yeah, was. Yeah. But but she had such a lousy life. Oh, yeah. So it's like if any, just that last scene where she's she's sort of young again and she's there mm. with her daughter and the daughter is not a ghost anymore. It's like. Everything is right with the world. So that's that's what you're left with. Yeah. But also to note, the Dollhouse episode was amazing, too, of course. And uh, sorry for mixing those up, everybody. Uh, the older I get, the more my brains turn to mashed potatoes. But also there's a lot of episodes. And um, yeah. Oh, my friend, my friend Kathy is in the house and she's saying, uh, yes, the are you, uh, well, sorry, are you afraid of the darks? And, you know, it had some Twin Peak-ish type of endings, too. And uh, that's that's true. There is like a great amount of unsettling vibes that can scare you a lot more than a monster in the dark. You know, sometimes it doesn't always have to be so on horror doesn't have to be so on the nose because we're all scared of different things and different things can make us afraid. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. All right. So Dylan Smith is saying, are you afraid of the dark episode? The tale of the full moon. I thought it was so funny seeing the werewolf big <laughs> grin was funny. Yeah. That was a really cool episode too, where, uh, you know, he gets, he, essentially gets a dog <laughs> yeah well it's well i mean that was that was the other episode that ron oliver wrote and directed that was his, his baby um and and it's, it was really kind of ahead of its time because it was about there could be all different kinds of families yeah <laughs> it's and then this was this is very much a mixed family and and so it it's done it's fun and it was campy and and uh it it, it felt kind of like a goosebumps episode frankly <laughs> it was more like that but really it, it said something really important it's like yeah. you know they're all different kinds of families people are different and and so it, it's it's a in the end it's a lovely episode with a lovely sentiment uh and and funny is and fun is is all heck <laughs> so, I, I really i really like i thought it was cool when the stepdad well the boyfriend i guess at the time before he's a stepdad uh comes in and kind of just quietly explains that his brother has this disease and all of a sudden, this big menacing werewolf is just kind of like this really sympathetic, really sympathetic, just almost not not cowering, but, uh, you know, kind of like almost he almost has a, this guilty look on his face. He's just like, I I just wanted to play, you know, and <laughs> I, I, I thought that was a really cool take on a werewolf having seen so many werewolf things that's not usually what it is it's either big menacing creature that is extremely painful to uh to turn into or shirtless sexy dude like yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. there's there's yeah. Oh, but uh you know symp- symp- sympathetic uh man's best friend is not the werewolf interpretation <laughs> right, you usually yeah. get to see now that's, dj that's ron oliver ron, he, he he that was his baby dj i gotta ask you and as soon as I look through your IMDb, you've done a lot of cool projects. And something I noticed in the, the the well, it's for the Disney series, The Wonderful World of Disney. And it's considered an episode, but it's kind of a full movie, in my opinion. The Tower of Terror movie. Yeah. And as I'm watching it, I because I because I've just went down this deep Disney vibe. And uh, thanks to the show Behind the Attraction. Um, that really specializes on the history of all these uh, events uh, 
in Disney park attractions. I, I was doing a, a deep dive on uh, Tower of Terror and realized that there was a movie now before perusing IMDb. I just I'm like, hey, Gutenberg's in it. Cool. So I'm watching it. And there's like this musical cue at one point. I'm like, God, this really reminds me of Are You Afraid of the Dark? I wonder who directed it. Oh, my God, it's DJ. <laughs> oh, no, kid, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There was there was a little vibe to it that I'm just kind of like so all you are you for the dark fans out there I believe it's on YouTube right now look up the yeah, movie yeah. Tower of Terror and it's got Chris a very young Kristen Dunst and uh, Steve Gutenberg and it's a really charming movie tell me about being involved in that well it was uh, in between we did sixty five episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark uh, and we thought we were done at that point. Because all Nickelodeon wanted was 65 episodes. That's That was the thing. It wasn't like we got canceled. It was just like, we want 65. That's all we need. Because what they do is they strip shows. It was on Saturday night. But then eventually they're going to strip it. And and the schedule for stripping is is 13 weeks. Stripping mm -hmm. meaning it's on Monday through Friday. So yeah. five days a week times 13 weeks is 65. So they yeah. wanted 65 episodes and that was it. So we were done. Thank you. Thanks for the memories. Um, when I left, a number of people had left Nickelodeon to go to work for Disney. And they were essentially poaching talent. <laughs> so they came to me to say, hey, why don't you do a deal with us? And we're thinking of, it, it, they hadn't done this before, and they were developing a couple of them, movies based on their theme park rides. They were actually, back then, they were developing a Pirates of the Caribbean animated movie. Um, and, and I saw a lot of the drawings that were intended to be Pirates of the Caribbean. It obviously, it went on to be live action. Uh, they had developed a Space Mountain movie. Um, there are a couple other ones, but they said, Hey, we've got this tower of terror thing. We've got a guy that makes spooky kid shows. I bet he could do this. So they, that's what I do. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said, would you, would you want to do this? So I'm like, no. okay, <laughs> fine. So, uh, it was, it was a great experience. It was, uh, it was one of the few things I got to shoot in Los Angeles. I usually I'm off to some Montreal or someplace like that. So, uh, so it was part of the wonderful world of Disney. They were bringing back, ABC was bringing back the wonderful world of Disney for Sunday nights. It's something that I watched when I was a little kid. I mean, that show started in 1955. It was originally created to help finance Disneyland, the, the building of Disneyland. Okay. Um, and it had many incarnations over the years, and it was off and it was on, it was off and it was on. And back in the late 90s, they were saying, uh, we want to bring it back Sunday nights, and we want to make it family movie night. And we're going to show a lot of uh, classic Disney movies, but we also want to do some originals. And but we want the originals to be splashy, like we don't because we don't want the ratings to be Toy Story, Mary Poppins, original movie, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Cars, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's like what happens when a cover band plays an original song. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like yeah, we're not going to watch this thing. So they tried to have movies that are a little bit splashier than it wasn't a Disney Channel movie. It was a ABC movie. Um, probably the most successful, famous one they made, which actually aired the week after Tower of Terror, was uh, a remake of Cinderella with Whitney Houston as the fairy godmother and Brandy as Cinderella. That was that was their big one. That was probably the most hmm. successful, famous one they did. I remember that one. And it got all the ad time too, by the way. So, so we were the week before, like, you remember us? Come on, we're on too. Um, so the the idea of making a movie based on a ride kind of stemmed from how do we make these movies elevate them to be a little bit more of an event than just a, a Disney movie um, or a Disney Channel movie. And and so that's when they came to me to make that. And and so I got to make it. And and it was great. And I got to have a great cast and shot it. And I, I think it came out pretty well. I, I don't know why it's not on Disney Plus, frankly. I, but but other than I, I don't Cinderella, know either. It, no idea. The only thing I can guess, and and the only one of those movies, when I say those movies, is movies, I don't know how many years the mm. series ran for, you know, that incarnation. I don't know how many movies they made, but they made a lot of movies, they probably made 20, 25 movies. Yeah, I'm guessing something like that. Um, as far as I know, the only one that actually made it to Disney Plus was Cinderella. Okay, uh, and probably because it was just that big of, of a movie, and it was just recently that it was on. Um, none of those movies have turned up anywhere. I think what they're doing is they're kind of like we're going to run out of stuff eventually, so they are keeping things in their back pocket just in case they need to, you know, really flood the content gates. Maybe. Um, because even there's this movie 
a friend of mine named Patrick Reed Johnson directed called When Good Ghouls Go Bad. And that was oh, yeah. Based, yeah, based on a story by Earl Stein. And that's a beautiful movie, low budget, but it's got Christopher Lloyd in it. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful. But that's not on Disney Plus either. So a lot of uh, uh, what we do in the shadows, which is a hilarious show, is owned by FX, which Disney owns now. It's not on Disney Plus either. So there's so many things that leave my head scratching. I'm like, why? At least in Canada. Cause it's nowhere else. I'm like, why isn't that on Disney plus yet? So I don't know. So yes. yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a right thing. I, I, maybe, I maybe, I don't know, but, but, but why isn't it, why isn't are you afraid of the dark? Like widely on some app right now, you know, like all the is. seasons. Oh, in the States, I think in the States, <laughs> but, it's not, it's in the states. not, not all of them are here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So, so it is, yeah. okay. um, but there is something, Oh, this is something mm. that bothers me uh, mm. not to be a downer, this, but sure. I saw something. Uh, that really kind of upset me. And maybe I'm the only person that's upset by it. Um, a young person blew you off for a concert and, uh, you know, it was yeah, the day you died and stuff. So I had, and now I'm dead. Terrible. And got terrible. Yeah. I hate that. Um, <laughs> but I think this is only in Canada, by the way, which is why I'm even bringing it up to you, is that there's on Netflix, there's a show, I want to say it's called Fear Street. Yeah. Uh, it's an R.L. Stein thing. Yeah. And, uh, and it's on Netflix, I believe. Yeah. And, I saw this thing on online. Someone who posted it, and I think it's only in Canada. I, I don't think it's in the states. Okay. Where Netflix in Canada created a little promo for Fear Street. Yeah, with with Are You for the Dark actors? Yeah, with it's Ross, Daniel, you, you, and uh, yeah. I, I have a problem with that. Okay. And and the reason I have a problem with it is because a those are my characters. It's my situation. <laughs> they didn't talk to me about it, but fine. It's done well. I mean, it's fine. It's kind of good. You know, it's kind of cool to see those guys back together again. But what bothers me about it is that they're promoting this show that is nothing like Are You Afraid of the Dark? It is violent mm -hmm. and it's gory. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, you took these talk about what you said before about you know the mm -hmm. kinds of stories these kids are going to tell, these characters are going to tell, you know what they're going to tell. They are not going to be telling those stories. Yeah. And, and that bothers me. That's like, whoa, you really kind of bastardize these characters to to do it and and you know, i'm not going to make a stink out of it because I, I don't have any, nothing i could say it's just me going hey you kid you darn kids um but it, it, i saw that and it really bugged me that, okay uh, that it took something that i created and and changed it to to those those characters would not be telling those stories and, and that's that's what bothered me about it so does anyone care? Hey, you're the I creator, sir. <laughs> what? You're, the, you're the creator, sir. I was just happy to see Ross and Daniel on camera in HD. I was like, wow. Yeah, on that yeah. level, it was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. They, they look great, and Jody was there, too. So that was like, yeah. hey, look at this. And, and I was fine with it until they started showing clips from the show. I'm like, whoa. Okay, whoa, gotcha. This is, yeah. not, this is not right. And so. F funny you say that. Uh, um, oh my God, K Casey Kasem uh, kind of stopped doing Shaggy at one point, and and uh, then when he agreed to come back, he said, "I will do this, but you need to make Shaggy a vegetarian." And then when he wasn't a vet, when Casey Kasem wasn't Shaggy, you swear to God, Shaggy was like owned owned a pizza hut or something and just was pounding down uh, sausages and meat whenever Casey Kasem wasn't around. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how like, you know, people can create characters and the vibes and just what they will do later on. But uh, no, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting that they didn't even talk to you, to be honest. Um, well, but, but speaking of that, uh, I see on IMDb, uh, you know, they credit you for creating, are you afraid of the dark in this new iteration? I've never seen this new iteration. DJ, I got to say, mm -hmm. I have not seen any new episodes or are you afraid of the dark, but how involved are you in that show? Zero. Okay. I thought so. Uh, and there are two, there are two iterations. There was, they rebooted yeah. it and they re rebooted it. Yeah. I saw the first one. Okay. Uh, the reason why Ned's and my name's all over it is uh, mm -hmm. it's our birthright. I mean, gotcha, we created gotcha. the show. Yeah. So uh, and believe me, that was, that took some doing, but yeah, it yeah. was the right thing to do. So, so it's fine. Okay. Um, okay. The, so I like to say that, <laughs> If you like the reboots, you're welcome. Sure. Because we created the show. If you don't like it, we had nothing to do with it. So don't blame us. It's not. And, and Frank, it, and I, I didn't see the second one. I saw the first one. It yeah. was okay. Um, cool. It would, you know, kept the right tone, kept all that kind of stuff. But but it's not Are You Afraid of the Dark. 
I just feel like it's none of my business. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like if my parent, uh, like, let's say someone was a big fan of the Ramones and, you know, uh, Fall Out Boy puts out an album and they're like, what the hell is this crap? It's just like watered down <laughs> versions of, of what the Ramones started back. It's even though that's a large generational gap, the right. um, well, actually, no, this it's how I feel as a Green Day fan listening to younger band. Okay. who were younger bands at the time like my comical romance and fallout boy i'm just like i already started to turn into an old man yelling at a cloud even then it's you know i just kind of feel like my buddy dean said it to me he's like dude it's, it's none of our business and i'm like that's the <laughs> best expression ever it's like it's not as good it's not bad it's none of our business and that's how i feel about the the new the new show and um and it's funny go ghost Rider, had a uh, had a reboot on Disney Plus, uh, sorry on Apple Plus, Plus, and my girlfriend and I got about eight minutes into it before we turned off unsubscribed to Apple Plus and never spoke of it again, just in a sense. And it's fine; it's none of my business. <laughs> but unless it's about a bunch of kids from Brooklyn who all have kind of diverse personalities that kind of reflect New York in a way that the show friends never did and solve mysteries by reading and writing, as opposed to the whole Jumanji. If you read the book, they come out of the book. You know, I sound like an old man. I know, but, <laughs> but, but that's, but that's how I feel about it. Even the goosebumps movies. I'm like, can it just be about the stories? Even the new, are you for the dark? Uh, yeah. series they did the thing where the stories keep coming to life and i'm like what's wrong with telling a story <laughs> and cutting to it what's wrong with that but uh you know well yeah. I, I actually even though i had nothing to do with the production of ghost rider mm. um i i am a part of that show you wrote the uh, pilot no, no, no. Oh, 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 no. The original one, yes. I wrote the Yeah, pilot. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, not, I thought, I'm not, talking about the reboot. The, no, no, no. Not the thing that we should not be named. I'm talking about the original. <laughs> I'm talking about the original pilot with Jamal, Gabby, Alex, and the gang. Right, like, right. that was a good time. You know, episodic television like that, DJ, didn't really exist. Like, kids kids shows usually came and went and the power rangers fought and killed the well destroy defeat the bad guy by the time the 25 minutes ended yeah. To, to, yeah. but to be on a multiple story arc to have to go back and catch it as it aired or if one of your friends recorded it and the pressure and the intensity of waiting for that resolution was something that my like nine-year-old brain was very new to yeah. and uh i'll never forget seeing Ghost Rider for the first time please tell me anything about working on Ghost Rider because there's nothing on the internet. <laughs> Zilch. Well, well, the, um, well, for one, as, as much as I, I like to say I wrote the pilot, mm. technically I did not write the pilot because they didn't want to call it the pilot. They called it the test episodes. Sure. I did well, write the first episodes. There you go. Well, you wrote the first episodes and that's what IMDB tells me. So, uh, you know, yes, when I, have I, they I, ever I, been wrong? Right. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, no, seriously, so this show comes at you how was it pitched to you? Cause this is a weird show, a bunch of kids with a ghost solve mysteries by reading and writing. Like it has never been done before that. It has never really been done since that, even with the reboot of apparently right. let them still <laughs> use words anyway. Um, well, it was, it, yeah. it was a joint. I, I did not create the show. It was a joint creation between Sesame workshop or children's television workshop. Yeah. The street. And one by the name of Liz Nealon, who was really kind of the, the major force behind it. And they came gotcha. up with this idea. They said, it's four episodes. Each story is four episodes. Um, and it's going to, yeah, there we go. And it's going to be about uh, ghosts that, that it's all about literacy. And yeah. the ghost is going to show them how to read and give them clues to whatever the thing is. And they, and they I don't remember if she told me that do a story about a, possible arson of a store i i forgot what it was <laughs> see that's deep that's deep like you know you didn't be like someone stole someone's pie or a cupcake right. or someone's <laughs> dog's missing it's like no someone burned down someone's store and those kids with the masks were freaky too wow yeah yeah so so and you know who played the dad in the first episode oh right that's true the, the dad, dad changed the dad changed it's true yeah yeah uh no this is a good one okay Samuel L. Jackson. Right. Yeah. My God. In, uh, in, the, in that first arc. Yeah. So so th what they said was, we're not, we don't want to do the first episode okay. because we don't want to spend time having to set everything up. We want to see how the show is going to work 
on episode or story three. So we're going to pick it up in the middle. So that's what they gave me the assignment to do it. Um, so I wrote this whole story. And um, the, the interesting th thing was that um, th that period of time, I wrote three shows. Yeah, I wrote the test episodes for Ghost Rider. Yeah. I wrote and then produced the pilot for Are You Afraid of the Dark? And yeah. I wrote and produced the pilot for a show called Crisscross, which was on Showtime. And I lived in Connecticut at the time. Is Crisscross based on the rap act by any no, chance? No, no, okay. no, it was with a C. They were in gotcha. K. They were C. Yeah. Um, Chris Hilton and Oliver Cross. Um, and so these three pilots, I mean, I had nothing to do with the production of Ghost Rider. I just, I wrote the episodes. And uh, so these three pilots were made. And you have no idea if the show is actually, any of these shows are going to go to series. And I was in Connecticut and I was sitting around going, you know, if I'm going to be serious about this TV thing, I need to move to Los Angeles. So I moved to Los Angeles, at which yeah. point all three shows got picked up for series. Ghost Rider shot in New York. Yeah. Are You Afraid of the Dark shot in Montreal. Chris Cross shot in Nottingham, England. It, they they asked me they asked me to come out to Ghost Rider as the head writer, but I didn't create that show. Yeah, I didn't create the other shows, and I wasn't going to be able to do them all. So I was like, "Thank you, but I, I'm going to work on the shows that I created." So that's when I made those two shows. Um, let, let's jump ahead. You you will appreciate, given that you know Ghost Rider, you you will appreciate this. So jumping way ahead to a couple of years ago, there's yeah. Apple TV Plus has rebooted Ghost Rider, and it's it's you're right, it's a different thing. The characters are coming out of the books and whatnot. It's not bad. And, it's none of my business. It's actually it's okay. It's it's yeah. it's pretty good. It's a good show. Yeah. Um, you know, it's gimmicky, but it's good. And um, frankly, I haven't watched them all, so I don't really know because there is a ghost, yeah. and I'm not so yeah. sure how the ghost somehow gets the characters. There. I, I don't know how it works. But a friend of mine runs Apple TV Plus Family Division. She said we're doing the reboot. Of the show. I don't think she even knew I wrote the pilot to Ghost Rider. I even feel said, bad now. Now that you say that, and just my stupid fanboy ranting before, I'm just oh, like, oh, oh I'm that'll such make a you jerk. really feel bad. Oh, I'm such a jerk. Go. I'm sorry. I retract. I I retract my statement. <laughs> I was drunk and <laughs> it's a, it, was, it was an out of body experience. It's yeah. it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good. Show. I was possessed. It won the Emmy for best kid show. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, last year or two years ago. So she said. So what we're going to do? We're taking. Books yeah. that are known, classic books. We're, we've got Frankenstein, we've got Jungle Book, we've got Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and that's where the characters are going to find those books. But we want an original book too. Will you write us an original book? So I was like, Yes, I will. So I wrote a book called Trinity. So that was one of the books that within the episode, written by DJ McHale, the characters come out of this book. So the the concept of the thing they gave me is they said. It's all about perception. This is a story about perception. So we we want it to look like it's a, a Western, but it's really science fiction. Can you do that? I'm like, of course I can. So so I wrote this book, and and I twisted it. It went from a Western. It went to it went to science fiction. It went to a medieval story, and then once it's all settled in the end and it's all ended, I added an epilogue, and the epilogue said that this actually wasn't a story at all. This was a video game. So oh. that, and I wrote the story set up like a video game that the characters had to get, get pick up things and, and do tasks and all that kind of stuff. So when you go back and think about it, it's like, oh my God, it was a video game these kids were playing. In that epilogue, the kids who were playing the video game were Jamal and Gabby from the original series. Oh, wow. <laughs> so... No one would, a couple people picked up on it, but you would have had to have been a ghostwriter fan, picked up that book, read it, read it all the way at the end, and they went, wait a minute, those are the characters from the original series, Jamal and Gabby. So they made a remote request. And then, oh, just to make you feel really bad, by the way. Sure. I'm I'm already, uh, I'm already feel like, uh, you know, I left an old lady alone in an apartment. So well, I'm going to you know, go for it. Yeah. And you're really going to hate this. Okay. So uh, again, I had nothing to do with the making of the show. <laughs> Um, but they asked me and a second season came out and yeah. they have this, you know, on cable and streaming services, they have value added stuff. They have behind the scenes things. They have all that kind of stuff. Well, Ghost Rider has a thing called Ghost Rider Beyond the Page. Cool. And it's about one of the characters who's writing a story and I'm the host. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Playing me. 
Yeah, <laughs> so I host the whole thing. And it was a pandemic shoot, so I was shooting the house, and, and so so it's it's me introducing the thing and about this girls writing the thing. So so I'm I'm sort of part of that the new ghostwriter family. Yeah, so. but that's really cool. But that's really cool though, and it's important that conversations like this happen because I will revisit the show, get over myself, and uh, you know. But that's the whole. You you have to forget thing. about the original. And just yeah, take it. But I don't want to forget about the original. We. We we sing the song all the time. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a really good show. It was a I, terrific show. Exactly. And I, I'll give, actually, I'll give you another thing. So yeah. Ghost Rider ran on PBS for a couple of seasons. Yeah. Then it got canceled. Then it got picked up on CBS okay. for one season. And the uh, guy yeah, who produced yeah. that season was my partner, Ned, from Are You Afraid of the Dark? Cool. He produced cool. The, the last season of Ghost Rider. So there's, there's a whole incestuous thing going on with Ghost Rider. Is that the one with the purple slime, I think? Yeah, I think those were the last few episodes. It was kind of like a, it was a story in a story. Um, yeah, okay. So something fascinating, um, just because, frankly, even Wikipedia knows nothing about the show. You and Ned should uh, write a lot down <laughs> online. Let's have some <laughs> blogs. Start a podcast. Um yeah when you write these first episodes of ghost writer, how much do they hand you? Do you have to create any character names or did they already have the show Bible? Like pretty much uh, like figured out. Uh, well, I'm trying to remember how so long ago with ghost writer. They gave me a lot. They, they, they gave me a lot. They, they had mm -hmm. already created the character. Cause remember too, this is unlike a show that is purely an entertainment type show yeah. where you just, you could pretty much do whatever you want. This thing was an educational show. So mm -hmm. they, it was children's television workshop. So this thing is was wrung out six way from Sunday from every person who was like, you know, the content person, the the literacy person. The, the. So right down to who those characters were and what their names were was mm -hmm. all calculated to support that agenda of literacy and teaching literacy and all that. So this wasn't just this wasn't let's scare kids. This was <laughs> this was a very calculated thing. So there were a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, which is another reason why I didn't necessarily want to be the writer on the show. Because it's like, well, this is too much. Uh, this is too much going on. Is the restrictions of how to write this thing? So with Ghost Rider, I they did hand me quite a bit, which is why I say I have no problem with it not being called the pilot. Mm -hmm. I, I call it the pilot because that's what people think of as the first episode. Of course. Um, but but also, according to the Writers Guild, the person who writes the first episode of a show or the pilot of a show. Is given the created by credit, ah. and I did not create that show, okay. so there's no way I would pretend to say, "Hey, I got the writing credit; I should get created." No, that's which is frankly, probably they didn't call the pilots; they didn't want to have to give me the, the created by credit, <laughs> but they shouldn't have. I, I didn't deserve it; I didn't earn it. I, so they gave me a lot with Ghost Rider; a lot was in place. Okay. The whole idea. I'll give you one thing. Do you know who the ghost was? No. No, I do. 30 years. Who is the ghost? <laughs> All right, everybody on the internet, get your crap ready. Share everybody. We're going to find out who Ghost Rider was. All right, and please. Ghost Rider was Jamal's great, great, great grandfather. Okay. Who was an escaped slave. Wow. And one of the ways he was able to escape. You know, this yeah. never came out in the show. No. This, some point they were hoping there to they would come out, but uh, one of the things that he escaped, and one of the things that that he bettered himself is he taught himself to read, okay. and so he became literate, and so and he was passing that down to the to his love of literacy. He, he's passing that to his kids. So he was an escaped slave who was Jamal's great 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 grandfather, which would explain. Um... Yeah, because there has always been a family connection with Jamal and uh, uh, Jamal and Ghost Rider. There was there seemed to, well, Jamal was the first one to find him, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was this really cool episode. Well, not cool episode, but there was this really intense uh, batch of episodes where Ghost Rider had to go back in time to kind of clear the name of like a little kid who would grow up to be the doctor that would uh, 
<laughs> this sounds so soap opery, but it's true. Who would grow up to be the surgeon that would save Jamal's dad's life when he's a kid? Like it's oh, really, okay. yeah. And he was Ghost Rider was like literally almost killing himself going to and from time. And you'd think this sounds kind of silly, but back in the day, it was a sweating induced hour of drama. <laughs> it <laughs> two, was two hours. <laughs> yes, two hours. Uh, but um, that 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 that's really amazing, man. It's really. Uh, it's really cool that you're able to touch upon all these properties and get all these, sh all these shows in production at once. That's, that's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody's going to ask you these questions, but people of multiple people have asked this and I just want to ask you in one fell swoop. I don't know what happened to Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your favorite episode over your afraid of the dark? I mean, it's like picking your kids, but there's gotta be at least a top few yeah, there there is i mean you can't the one thing i'll never say is what's my least favorite episode because of course there are no least favorite but, well, there might be a couple but but uh <laughs> and it, i do I've, I've answered this question a lot and and I'm i know and i apologize for asking it but i feel like uh, a jerk okay. not not paying it's fine by me yeah, yeah. someone's gonna say yeah we know what it is uh, he's gonna yeah. say it again i have a funny um, stan lee story similar to this but yeah <laughs> when you ask someone what their favorite mm -hmm. episode is um who watches a show it's the episode they like the most. When you ask someone who made the show, you bring in a whole nother level of criteria. What was um, easy? Yeah. Well, what was easy? Well, <laughs> my favorite episode is the show we did at the beginning of the second season. It was called The Tale of the Midnight Madness. And the reason it was my favorite episode, I, I, is it the best episode? I don't know. It was a good episode. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the beginning of the second season, and it was the first time that I felt like we finally got it that this is what we're capable of doing. We're firing on all cylinders. And that was really exciting to me to say, yeah, this is the quintessential. Are you afraid of the dark? This is good. So, so that was a breakthrough episode for me. So that's why it's my favorite. Not, not just because I thought it was a good episode, which I think it is, but it's because of what it represented for me to say, yeah, this is the beginning of a Renaissance. We're going to make some good episodes. So that that's my favorite. episode. I've, I've tons that I love. Um, some that I don't love so much, but, but, uh, you keep bringing this up someday off some, someday I'm going to have to like appeal uh, through the dark web to find out episodes that DJ Mikhail is not. I, I would never, I would never say what I don't like, but, but I, I'll say this mm -hmm. much that it's, and this is a good thing. And it's kind of yeah. cool where forget the layer of, I made the show. So therefore I have a whole different level of criteria. Take that aside. Just purely on a, is this episode any good or not? Um, there are some episodes that I think are just not very, I don't think any that are unwatchable, but there's some, I just, I just don't think are very good mm -hmm. yet. Other people, it's their favorite episode. Of course. So that's okay. That's, that's good. So, so that's why I, I wouldn't put a real, other than to say that one is my favorite for other reasons than just, I think it's a good episode. I would never say that sucked. I'll tell you one episode that yeah. is one of my favorite episodes that no one likes. That you, no one talks about it, no one cares, no one ever remembers it. It's like horrible because um, there was no monster in it. There was, okay. there was, there was, it wasn't that scary. It was really Twilight Zone like. Um, it was an episode written by a writer by the name of Jerry Wexler. I directed it. It's called uh, The Tale of Train Magic. Okay. And I uh, God, I love that episode. I just think it just, it's so perfectly Twilight Zone. And, and, uh, but, you know, there's no monster in it. The, okay. The bad guy is a, an evil train conductor. Okay, fine. <laughs> Ooh. You know, it's, so, uh, if you ever get a chance to watch that, that I got, I love that episode for all I sorts was, of reasons. I always like shows of, of yours, I could say, uh, where kind of like the scariest, most villainous character in the show is usually, some bully and not the monster itself you know when you just show like you know the dark side of humanity where you know the ant like you have your hero and you have your hero's heel <laughs> and then there's a the bad guy and usually usually the big scary bad guy can kind of like turn the hero and the bully together or you know mm -hmm. the bully is sometimes just a sacrificial lamb <laughs> but it, it it's, it's, it's not good to be the bully in there no um, but I, I messaged Ross, uh, uh, 
I messaged uh, Daniel and Ross before, uh, Ross, right before. I should have messaged him days ago. But Daniel DeSanto, I asked him, hey, I'm about to interview DJ. Do you have anything... Uh, do you have anything funny to say or do you want to like sneak on? He's like, Hey, thanks for the short, thanks for the long, short notice. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. And he's like, um, yeah, ask him who his favorite care, who his favorite cast member was. Oh, and really oh, pry. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. It's, Daniel. it's gotta be Daniel. It's <laughs> but it, it goes back to what's your favorite episode. It's, it's yeah. like, they're all your children. Of course. So, so, uh, you, you love them all. Um, I, I, one of the things that's so great about Daniel, one thing that, boy, the kind of bugs me a little bit mm. is that, you know, with the boom of 90s nostalgia, and I think your show is very much about 90s nostalgia. Um, we like ghosts. All about it. Yeah. <laughs> the ghosts and, and my of theory pop culture. Is, yeah. yeah it, it, my, my theory is that 90s kids are, people are kids in the 90s are starting to feel their own mortality. So suddenly, <laughs> suddenly nostalgia becomes a thing. You know, for me, the 90s were last week, but. Um, Every, everything does hurt now, so it's true. Yeah, it's suddenly it's like, when did I have that thing? Um, yeah, get used to it. Um, it, it kind of, a couple of things about, I mean, so everyone talks about all things 90s, but they really talk about Are You Afraid of the Dark quite a bit. I mean, I talk about the show more today than I did when it was on, quite frankly. <laughs> it's amazing. Like, there's, there's, we finished the show, and there's 20 years where I forgot that I made the show, and now suddenly I'm talking about it every day, um, which is fine. I like doing it. Um, but there, there are some things that kind of, and I love it. I love whatever anybody says, you yeah. know, the criticism. I like the parodies. I, aside from that thing on Netflix, which I'm not happy with, but, but I, I like the parodies. I like the, the people making fun of the episodes. I, I, they can find a Canadian accents. I, I love it all. Um, but there are two things that kind of bug me. One is, and this goes back to Daniel, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, that it seems like, most people's criteria, not everybody, most people's criteria of what made a good episode or a bad episode was how scary it was. And, and as I said to you before, that wasn't our whole goal. It wasn't just about being scary. It, there was a lot more going on with these episodes. So, so a story like Train Magic is not going to be a favorite episode because it wasn't that scary. It was weird and it was eerie, but, but it was a really good story. And, and so, you know, there's a handful of episodes that people talk about all the time and they're mostly because you know it's a ghastly grinner and it's zebo the clown and it's the pool monster because there are monsters and that and maybe that's because they're easy to remember because there's an iconic monster so you know not many people remember the long ago locket you know it's like because there's no monster in it so i like to think that the episodes were terrific not just because they were the scariest episodes but because they were good stories and they're good episodes so that's one thing that kind of bugs me a little bit but the other thing is that people, people really have dissed the last 26 episodes, hmm. season six and seven. Okay. It's like, it's like, I don't know if they've even seen them. Hmm. And, and I think a lot of these people are maybe 10 when the show first aired. And then when six and seven came on, they were 18. They probably weren't even watching the show anymore. And, hmm. and one of the reasons they say it's not as good as, as the first 65 or whatever is that there's a different midnight society. It's like, what has that got to do with it? <laughs> it was the same story, same kinds of stories, the same variety of stories, the same range of really interesting. There's we saw our best stories were in that 26. Yet yeah, somehow yeah. because they didn't like the midnight, because it was just because it was different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Daniel was the continuity. He was he was the youngest of the original cast. And I wanted some continuity with the newer cast and everyone else was, you know, they had their own children at this point. <laughs> so, but Daniel, you could still believe that he was, he was a teen, even though he probably wasn't a teen anymore. But so he, he mentioned by like season three, he had to like shave twice a day because he was like monstrously going through puberty very quickly. And so, uh, so, so he took over the role of the lead of the thing. And, and I course. thanked him so much for being able to do that. And he was, he was wonderful, but it really bothers me that I, I, I truly think that if that last group had been the original group, mm -hmm. that would have been the good group. Of course. <laughs> and then if that group came in the second group, Oh, you know, they're not as good as the first group. So I, it's, I wish people would be a little more, um, take a step back a little bit and realize what that season you... six and seven are none of their business, but it's the business of the kids who are, you know, of age and of who are age. supposed to be watching it. Yeah. And and there and the cast of the the 
second batch of Midnight Society kids is uh, nothing to sneeze at. I mean, you have Alicia Cushbert. Uh, you have a, a friend of the show, Vanessa Lenji, who is one of the nicest human beings on earth. Vanessa so is wonderful yeah. and uh, managed to be in every kid's show ever for a good <laughs> few years there. But uh, yeah, no, this, the second cast was, the second cast was lovely and a uh, funny story, DJ. And, and what's funny, it, like now, now I've, I've talked to so many wonderful people from, um, are you for the dark, including you, Ross, Daniel, um, but, and Vanessa, but it, it's it's funny, like back then, this was a big enough deal where if I told people this, it would be impressive. I was an extra in like one episode in which you see me walking in the far background with my back turned. And I like literally was such a bad actor back then. Not so much now. I'm a little better. But back then, I'm like walking over a curve, but completely overdo it like like <laughs> here's a curve i went over that curve like super mario like you should <laughs> nothing was natural about that performance but to just say that you were even in the background on an episode of you're afraid of the yeah. dark back then when i was like 16 was like really cool to say what, to what was the episode uh the one with tara lipinski mm -hmm. yeah the, the yeah. lunar locusts the lunar locusts um i believe is it Sean or Aaron? Which one? Which twin was it in that episode? I, you know, I I never remember. Okay, I don't because want to say the wrong was one. Also in thirteenth uh, um, floor. Yeah, I believe it's I not the one that. from X Men. Uh, so let's go with let's go with Aaron Ashmore. Um, okay. So Aaron Ashmore, his ex girlfriend, is talking to somebody in the door. In the door, they're um they're outside him and tara are about to get in a car and you see me in the far distance and it's just it's funny that something so little like that was enough conversations to impress people into giving you a beer when you're a teen now <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to imagine having been in an episode and there's so many people in the world who have been on this show and so many famous people it was like almost like are you afraid of the dark was almost like a casting agency in itself because you see people like Ryan Gosling, Neff Campbell, just to name a few that would go on to be these monster superstars. In fact, in Tale of the Prom Queen, I believe, um, Katie Griffin, who is a very famous voice actress who would go on to play Sailor Mars and Sailor Moon and all that stuff. She uh -huh. she's in this episode, too. So it's 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 amazing. Like every episode, you're going to find at least somebody that's done a bunch of other work and stuff well, there, well especially because there's so much production in canada too so yeah so you know they all grew up to be not all of them believe me a lot of them didn't as well but i i watched a, a show that that um it's a hugely popular show and for some reason i never took to it but i watched an episode and say what's all the big hubbub about yeah um it was schitt's creek okay and it's a huge show i mean it's hugely mm. popular it lasted uh, 12 years you know it's huge yeah. and i turned it on once and hey well it wasn't my cup of tea but there was a girl in it i'm like she was in Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> she was, it was, uh, I don't even know her name. Um, mm. but, but a lot of times, this is the first time these kids were on camera. I know. They'd never done anything. Jay Barishal had never been on camera before. And and he was like in four or five episodes. It's, it's really pretty cool to see all these kids. And a lot of times, I forget so many of these people. And, and but, but then I'm watching the show. Also, I, I, I'm tuned into shows or, or actors that i recognized from montreal yeah. especially adult they were adults back then because because mm. you know we use this there again much it was the english-speaking uh pool that was not huge so I ended up using a lot of adults over and over again and so i'd see someone on the, whatever movie it is playing a role i'm like oh i bet this was shot in montreal <laughs> because i know there's mark camacho again or something yeah so mark was, yeah yeah um it's fun. It's fun to see them all grow, and it's and it's weird to see them, the kids, as adults. Of course, because I I still see them as kids. Naturally, um, and I so I guess I have a little bit of a sense of what it's like to be a teacher, mm. you know, when you've taught kids in third grade, and suddenly they're running companies or something, <laughs> and you're like, oh my god, I'm, I changed your diaper once. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So it's 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 a it's a fun thing. Um, 
I, I, I was just thinking about it. I make, oh my God, so many people had their first jobs there. But you know what's really like wonderful about your series and the nature of it and the fact you had to cast so many people? It's like you literally gave opportunities to all these people that would kind of like light that spark that would become a film career afterwards because everybody needs their first break or their first job. And given the fact that you had such a large volume of episodes and roles to fill, like maybe without Are You Afraid of the Dark, some of these people wouldn't have gotten that acting bug. And uh, uh, my, Melissa Gallianos, who I've been uh, I've been a, in a relationship with for about ten and a half years, she later went on to be in a show called uh, Radioactive, and she's been in movies called like Laser Hawk and uh, a few others. But her first job ever was the, a small role as Sonia in the episode The Tale of the Renegade Virus. And, and, and it's, and she had this really big nineties perm in it. And it's funny because it, <laughs> it immortalized like the worst hair cause she's ever had. And she actually asked me not to watch the episode when I told her, I, I'm like, what episode were you in? I'm like, she's like, I'm not telling you. I'm like, I can find it online. You can either tell me or I'll be able to find it. And it's just funny that like this perm is now immortalized, but it's, um, but in general, it's just, it's amazing that, you know, your show was able to put, uh, present this stepping stone that mm -hmm. might have been pivotal for the not only the self-esteem but the drive of our future for performers yeah, yeah. almost like a battle of the bands in a really nice venue yeah where you're yeah. just kind of like hey kids i know you've been in a band for three months but look at the stage you could get to if yeah. in other w walks of life you work really hard yeah. and and it's and certainly again you know, i said before that it's five days of work but it's you had to be a professional it was this was not a let's put on a show in a bar and this was a real deal i i had a funny experience happen um mm. because there were you know there are a lot of kids and um when we came back to do uh season six and seven then we cast the new midnight society alicia cuthbert was one of the kids and she had been on a show with jay baruchel called uh popular, popular mechanics for kids yeah. so she had she had been working in, in with jay and they've been working it was a reality show but she'd been working mm -hmm. and, and she was terrific and we cast her to be in the midnight society and I, I, was it on the set i, I don't know but a, but a lot of these kids had watched the show they they knew the show so they were on the set and like i don't here's where we sit and we get the midnight dust and we do it so we, actually it must be kind of a fun thing to think oh my god i grew up with the show and now suddenly i'm on it and that, and that so that was pretty cool but at one point alicia said to me you know i was in an episode i was like really i you know i didn't remember i you know i don't remember you i said who directed it she said you did <laughs> <I thought>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah you gave me a speech it's the reason why i'm working here today yeah, right. yeah, we shared a cab together like <laughs> yeah you said never give up i always remember you <laughs> oh, oh boy you and, were at, and, and you were at my why. christening, like, <laughs> and so I'm thinking it was maybe like in the first season. He goes, okay, where it, no, it was the last of the 65 that we had done, so it wasn't uh, even that long before. Okay, and I was like, what? And then she told me who she was. I'm like, oh, oh my god, yeah. There, it was the last of the 65 was a, a show called The Tale of the Night Shift. And it was about a vampire that was on the loose in a hospital, and it was a shape shifting vampire. And one of the things the vampire did is it would take the shape of various kids or nurses or whatever, and then yeah, and then it would become the vampire and kill him or bite them. And there's one scene where where it's in the night shift in the hospital, and this nurse walks out of this room and she hears a giggle. And she looks down the corner and I pan over, and there's this cute little blonde girl in a bathrobe standing there, way in the distance. And the nurse says, uh, honey, how come you're not in your room? And the girl <laughs> giggles and runs away. That was the whole thing. Mm. The nurse runs after her. Cut to point of view. Where's the girl? Where is she? Oh, and then the nurse turns the corner and it's the vampire. So it was the girl. And that was Alicia. So it wasn't like she had a big part that I was, uh, you know, working on her method or whatever. But it was. Uh, so, yeah, so, all, so many of those kids went on to do really amazing things. And it's, and it's so fun to see them. Yeah. Um, there was there was one time oh god there was one time i don't know what show it was <laughs> but rachel blanchard was uh in the first couple of seasons she was in the campfire and uh i was watching i was flipping the channels around one night it was a long time ago i was flipping the channels around one night and there's some show i don't know what it was but it was it was 
it was all in close up, so you couldn't even tell who it was, but it was just like some, it wasn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was soft core. It wasn't quite that over the top, but it was like, it was like some hot scene going on mm. between a guy and a girl. And I was like, oh, what's this for? And I watch it. And then of course the close up, I'm like, oh my God, it's Rachel. Hey, oh, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. Oh my God. Ooh. I know. I know. But, and good for you. First of all, good for you. <laughs> and second, instead of being like, nice, like, it, you're like you know, you yeah, want to no. claw, you claw your eyes out. That's actually a very healthy reaction. Um, it was like being a dad. And seeing a of course. Of course. And it's, um, oh man, it's, it's so lovely to know. Uh, everybody, by the way, uh, this is the 30th anniversary of Are You Afraid of the Dark coming out for the very first time. Not necessarily on YTV or Canada, but in general. And it's um, it's been a hell of a 30 years. When I look at the show, I don't think it looks 30 years old. I'm sure the average child who has grown up on HD television will <laughs> say differently. But uh, I, for, I, for one, it's uh, despite the fact it's a spooky show, I consider it a warm blanket or a cup of soup to, uh, you know, feel comforting, to go back in time, to remember a time when cell phones wouldn't be riddled through all these episodes. I'm trying to imagine <laughs> how cell phones would have immediately solved half of the plots and, or Google <laughs> and how that would affect uh, how it would affect it. DJ, I got to ask if you were in charge of Are You Afraid of the Dark and new episodes and all that stuff, would you make would you make a series that would still be set in the 90s or would you make it very uh, modern day and have to write your stories around <laughs> obstacles such as cell phones and Google almost immediately solving the problems the kids get into? Well, I, I mean, I'm doing that all the time. So I'm writing stuff all the time, writing shows all the time, and I've got to contend with cell phones and how. So no, but I, I mean, are you afraid of the dark though? Like, are you afraid of the dark? I, I don't think it makes sense to be set in the '90s because the. Sh it depends on what the show is, and if I were to do a new season of Are You Afraid of the Dark, um, first thing I would do is I would bring it back to anthology. Because mm. because that's what Are You Afraid of the Dark is. Are You Afraid of the Dark is about the storytelling. Agreed. Uh, it, it, uh, we did one three part episode. It was kind of a movie called The Silver Sight, but that was yeah. a, back in the day, the OG. But but that was an anomaly. That was just that was, why not? We did everything. Why don't we try that? Um, but I would bring back to anthology because I think that really is Are You Afraid of the Dark? That's the heart of Are You Afraid of the Dark. Um, but I don't think it would make sense to set it in the 90s because mm. that would mean the show is being made for you. Mm. And it's none of your business. Gotcha. <laughs> that's been the tune. That's been the that's been the theme of the night. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it yeah. would be made for the new group of 10, 12 year olds who are watching the show. And to them, the 90s, that doesn't want the references wouldn't mean anything. It did not. It, it would, I would make a contemporary anthology series, uh, to, to look like a contemporary series, but, but with a, with a contemporary sensibility. I think that, that there's room for that kind of storytelling. Um, so that's, that's what I would do with it. And, uh, and I know how to avoid cell phones. It's amazing. How, it's getting rid of cell phones is like getting rid of parents. Mm. People always say, it's like, why in those Disney movies? How come parents are always dying? How come they're always going? I'm like, the, the heartstring part aside and the sympathy thing aside, you've got to get the parents out of the picture because if the parents are in the picture, the story becomes about the parents. Mm. The story's about the kids. So we did 91 episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark? I got rid of those parents 91 times. <laughs> always different ways, but it, it, the kid has to go on the adventure. They can't look because one of the things with all my writing is that i put a kid mm. in a situation and immediately start cutting off their avenues of escape yeah where i go for help first place you go you go to your parents parents are out of the picture well i'm going to go to the cops well the cops are out of the picture well, i'm going to go teach you know cutting up so basically all the people they look to for help are not there to help and the only person that can help them is them so that's they have to rely upon themselves to get out of whatever the fix is. So that's why I have to get rid of the parents. 
And so, I, and I've already gotten rid of cell phones so many ways in the books and the stories I've written. It's remarkable. It's something as simple as, oh my God, it's dead. <laughs> where can people find uh where can people find these books and do you have any suggestions for people to uh who are fans of your writing to uh you know look up sure uh my website is djmichaelbooks.com um and i'm on instagram and and uh facebook and twitter as dj mikhail i haven't gone so far as tiktok that's that's a bridge too far for me i I don't, I don't know what to do with that. And I'm, I don't dance, so it's not going to work. Um, but the, the DJ McHale books, it's not really about my shows. It's all about my books. Uh, and I would recommend probably my most popular book series is called Pendragon. It's a 10 book series. Um, it's huge. It's a hu If you like my writing, if you like my storytelling, um, you'll see it in book form there. And it's a big, huge adventure that spans 10 books. And it's about a kid that starts when he's 14 and he grows up to 18 over the course of the 10 books um, and grows up over the course of the 10 books uh, while he's dealing with the with the huge dilemmas that he's got to deal with. So I would say Pendragon. First book is called The Merchant of Death. So uh, check that out. I think I th if you like I Refer to Dark, I think I think you'd like that. Awesome, man. That's a... Uh... That's great to see. That's great to see that your creative voice has never lost its sound. I guess is that the expression? Whatever. I like that. Yeah. Um, everybody else out there. All right. Well, uh, I don't want to keep you all night, DJ. I definitely. You've been so generous to us with your time. We're going on one hour and fifty minutes, and it has been absolutely riveting. You're a natural storyteller, obviously, but not not just on paper, but your voice as well. I hope that you. Uh, I, I, I hope that you uh, do more broadcasting and speaking. And uh, I will give this new Ghostwriter show a chance because I want to <laughs> see this thing that you are telling me about where you're hosting Ghostwriter Beyond the Page. Beyond the page. Where, where can people see that? It, well, it's Apple TV Plus. Um, Apple TV Plus, okay. And, and you have to go to the Ghostwriter page. Yeah. And zip through episodes, trailers, mm. uh, what do they call it? Additional materials. Gotcha. And then there's a series called Ghostwriter Beyond the Page, and there's four of them, one for each of the books of the first season. It's, it's a little embarrassing. I feel a bit like Melissa saying, uh, you don't want to see the <laughs> renegade virus. It's, it's Her perm is pretty epic, man. <laughs> I, I, will, I will leave you with one other story that I think you'll get a kiss. Please do, yes. When, uh, when Ned and I first came up with the idea for Are You Afraid of the Dark, it wasn't a scary show we were going to tell bedtime stories for lazy parents. And the idea was, is the way I describe it, and I describe it very flippantly now, that what we're going to do, it's going to be really low budget. We're, it's going to be direct to video. We're going to get some old guy, some old guy actor who's, who's, who's not doing anything else, but people know who he is. And we're going to put him in, on an easy chair in front of a fireplace. And he's going to have a big book that says fairy tales. And he's going to read the fairy tales. And we're going to record these things. We're going to package it together in a video. And, and we're going to sell these videos. And when parents don't feel like reading to their kids one night, they just pop in the video and say, here you go. Let, let, let the old guy tell you the story tonight. Where we hit the brick wall was what kind of stories you wanted to, what kind of fairy tales. And they all seemed so boring. So Ned asked me the key question, which was, what kind of stories do you like when you were a kid? And I was like, I like scary stories. So Fairy tales became scary tales, and that metamorphosized. The old guy goes away because we don't want some old guy telling scary stories. Kids around the campfire, and metamorphosized into Are You Afraid of the Dark? Cut to 30 years later. I'm asked to host this uh, Ghostwriter Beyond the Page thing. And as I said, it was a pandemic shoot, so it was done at our house. Everyone who was in it was like, you know, yeah. done close up. And, uh, so they set up the set and, and, and all this kind action. of stuff. right yeah it wasn't even that i was the yeah. only one i was there i was the grip i was the gaffer i was the camera i was the uh, everything ah. uh set decorator wardrobe everything um and so and it didn't hit me until i'm literally there it's like i'm they dress me like freaking mr rogers <laughs> you know with like a like a v-neck sweater and a, and a thing whatever and I'm sitting in this easy chair in front of the fireplace with a book. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm the old guy. <laughs> ah! It's 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 the revenge, some kind of karmic revenge for me making fun of that person who never was in that thing that we never made. Me making fun of that, some old guy in front of the fireplace, you know, who's going to read a book. It's like, oh, my God, I'm the old guy in front of the fireplace reading a book. So, uh, yeah. So, so if you do happen to... 
go on it and you see some old guy, you can get a chuckle out of going, yeah, it's an old guy sitting in front of the fireplace reading from a book. <laughs> there we go. That's awesome, man. You can't laugh at yourself. Who can you laugh at? The tale of the full circle. The tale of the full circle. Exactly. All right. Well, um, oh, and right before we go, uh, if you have one, favorite cat, favorite character from Ghost Rider. From Ghost Rider. Oh, boy. It would have to be Jamal because he's you know, he was the the he was the, the first among equals. Yeah. He was yeah. the leader. Yeah, he was, he was jumped. And it's such a cool name, too. But I did like Gabby, too. She yeah. kind of, she's the one she had. It was an episode about um, arson, which we mm. talked about. And and I just wrote this line where she said, you know what that's called? That's called Carson. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. I don't think anybody else did. but We all found it. Um, I, I was just wanted to bring up uh, because uh, Phoenix Layden has it's just saying, um, uh, oh, Phoenix Layden's ca- uh, fa- favorite character was also Gabby. Not just, uh, you know, there's there's a select group of people that love the old Ghost Rider so much. And it's uh, really amazing that you were able to uh, be part of so much lore when it comes to uh, 90s, uh, 90s uh, tele- children's television. But uh, it's, it you know, somebody uh, will we'll say, I'll say this before we go. Somebody can write one hit single and live on that for the rest of their life. They said, I made my, my, I made my stamp on the universe good enough, but it thrills me to know, especially with your books that you're telling us about that there is a voice inside of you that never said good enough. It kept going. Are you afraid of the dark was 30 years ago. You look amazing. (laughs) <laughs> you're say, like uh you're saying i'm the old man in the chair i'm just like i think like that actress in uh, in, 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 the, in the in this uh silent ghost episode uh they might have to age you up a bit to properly convey the the geezer you were telling us about that was sitting in the chair but um but but uh some creative voices can never be silenced i'm glad that you are one of those individuals thank you very much for joining us today on behalf of the audience everybody is saying thank you so much dj and how much they loved your work thank you very much for spending so much time with us uh this has been absolutely incredible it's always fun thank you for having me and just one last thing how do you spell afraid a f r a i d oh okay i gotcha Wait, we've been talking for two and a half. Uh, we've been talking for two hours, and we only you only noticed that now. I wrote it really fast. I've, whole time, whole time. Stop looking at it. You, you could have told me. You could have told me. No, <laughs> that would have thrown you off your game. I, I, no I, way. I, oh no, I'm told. I'm. <laughs> I'm told. I'm. 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 I. The spotlight of how many stupid things I do in a day does <laughs> not detour my creative voice. <laughs> All right, everybody. Nice. Uh, Thank you so much for joining uh, us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, a DJ, uh, me and the re- and the fellow illiterate Canadians. <laughs> appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And, thank you for having me. Right. And uh, everybody out there, like, share this video, show everybody, give them a disclaimer about spelling errors, and uh, let's uh, let's let everybody else who love these series uh, bask in the enjoyment that was the revelation of who Ghost Rider really was. Wow, that's amazing. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs>